Welcome aboard, shipmates. My name is Jerry Bryant, and I'll be your captain professor on this voyage on the Shanty Sea. This is episode three of the Shanty Talk series, in which I take a traditional shanty, which is a sailor's work song, and I explain its origins, uh, the context, and its uses on board 19th century square riggers. If you missed the first two episodes, you can subscribe to this channel so you can watch them, and also be notified about when I post new episodes. In episodes one and two, I explored the old capstan shanties, Spanish ladies, and Santiano. This episode will look at the well-known halyard shanty called Blow the Man Down. Perhaps you heard of it. The song most likely dates to the 1840s or 1850s, which was the golden era of shanty creation. I'm going to explain the history of it and its historical context. I'll describe what type of work the sailors used it for on board ship, and then I'll define the sailor terminology and talk that show up in the verses. Ah, I think I hear the mate calling all hands to the halyards, so let's get going. Every true shanty was associated with some specific job on board a ship. There were two main categories of shanties, heaving shanties and hauling. Heaving shanties were used when the work involved pushing, and I covered those in the first two episodes of Shanty Talk. Hauling shanties, on the other hand, were used when pulling, and that was mainly on the ropes. Blow the Man Down was used as a hauling shanty, and it was mainly for raising the sails, the square sails on a sailing ship. Now, some shanties were traditionally used for certain jobs, Blow the Man Down, according to the old retired sailors it was collected from, was mostly used for the topsail halyards, and I'll explain what that means a little later on. There are several different versions of this shanty, with over a hundred different verses that have been collected over the years. I've chosen what's known as the Flash Packet version, and have curated a set of verses that tells the story of what it was like to be a packet rat 180 years ago. So, okay, I'm going to go tail on to the foretopsail halyard and let the shanty do the talking. Oh, as I was a rolling down Paradise Street to make way, hey, blow the man down. A handsome flash packet I chanced for to me. Oh, give, give me some time to blow the man down. down. Now this saucy flash packet, she says under me. Come in, way, hey, blow the man down. There's a dandy black baller just ready for sea. Give, give me some time to blow the man down. So I packed up my sea chest and I signed on that day. Way, hey, blow the man down. And with that flash packet, I spent my half pay. Give me some time to blow the man down. The word blow, by the way, refers to knock or strike. Strike the man down. I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty glad they went with blow. That just sounds better when you're singing. Now, we're starting out in Liverpool, England, and that's on the West Coast. It was the, one of the major seaports for, uh, for the United Kingdom and the closest to the East Coast of America, which is where the packet uh, trade originated. Paradise Street was the heart of the 19th century sailor town district there, which was, and it was replete with saloons and bars, dance halls and brothels, all of which were designed to separate sailors from their money. Flash packet was a sailor term for a lady who frequented that part of the city. Now, it was no coincidence that our narrator just happens to uh, encounter a flash packet. She was, you might say, doing some customer development. Uh, the adjective flash, by the way, ref was, a, was 19th century slang for slick or fancy. Um, it shows up in numerous shanties, uh, sometimes to describe ships and sometimes to describe people, both women and men. A sailor town flash packet is not to be confused with a sailing flash packet. The labels are identical, but as we know, context is everything. 
here to avoid future confusion are the two different species of flash packet. So take a nice close look at this. It's also not a coincidence that the flash packet points out that there's a ship getting ready to leave port. That's the black baller. Now, why is that? Well, a sailor wouldn't have any money unless he had just returned from a voyage or was just about to start a new voyage. And in this case, our narrator has been ashore long enough that he's just about broke. The professional woman he meets makes him aware that there is a ship which needs seamen and that he can sign up to work on that ship. Now, when a sailor signed up to work on a ship, they, he was given an advance on his pay, usually his first month's wages. That was intended to allow him to buy clothing and supplies for the trip, but often they just spend it on carousing with flash packets. In this case, our sailor is splitting his pay, that's the reference to half pay, with someone back home. Could be a mother, could be a wife. I'm not making any judgments here. Now you know why the lady in the song made her suggestion in the first place. Oh, by the way, a sailor's sea chest was his luggage for the voyage, but way cooler than a Louis Vuitton suitcase, in my humble opinion. Now, a natural question you may have is, what is a blackballer? Well, the blackball line was the first of several shipping lines that traveled between England and the United States. They painted a black circle on their foresail and also flew a flag from the main mess with the black circle painted on it. That was their logo. Other packet lines had a red cross or a blue swallowtail. Um, there, were, there were a number of different logos that the companies used. Now this packet service started in 1816. It transformed transatlantic travel because up until that time, Ships sailed when it was convenient, when they had enough cargo, when the weather was good, but the packet sailed on a strict schedule. They disrupted the market because people could plan on leaving on the 1st and on the 15th of the month from either side of the Atlantic. Now, of course, tides and weather don't always cooperate with corporate schedules, and so the packets often were sailing through some of the worst weather, and that meant the sailors were working in some pretty dreadful conditions as they sail back and forth. But many of the shanties that we love and sing today originated during this period. The packet ship period was roughly from 1816 to, to the mid-1860s. And it's because shanties, which were work songs, were essential at making the hard work on board a ship easier and more efficient. Having signed a contract to work on that black ball liner, Jack now has to leave his lady love behind and go to sea. Now as soon as that packet was ready for sea, way hey, hey, we blow the man down. down. It was then that we went on a hell of a spree. Oh, give, give me some, some time to blow the man down. down. Now it's tinkers and tailors, shoemakers and all. Way, hey, blow the man down. That ship is prime seamen aboard the black ball. Give me some time to blow the man down. Oh, you see these poor bastards as aloft they do scoot. Away, hey, blow the man down. Assisted along by the tow of a boat. Give me some time to blow the man down. For the rest of the song, we're treated to an experienced sailor's view of landlubbers on their first voyage. Just imagine being one of the aforementioned tailors or shoemakers and hearing this tatted, earring, sunburned sailor singing about the life you'll be living for the next few weeks. Holy crap. <laughs> oh, an important point in case you missed it, the packet referred to in the first line here is the packet ship itself, not the young lady back home. Now, because the packet ships were so successful and because the working conditions were so bad, 
there was a huge demand for sailors to man the ships. This version of the shanty mocks the remarkably unqualified men that thought they could make some money while taking a transatlantic cruise. And of course, a real sailor man just had nothing but disdain for a green hand like that. Now, in case you don't know, a tinker is someone that mended pots and pans and metal things. And the toe of the boot reference is a foreshadowing of the horrors that the landlubbers are going to be enduring during the trip. As soon as we clear over old Mersey Bar, way, hey, blow the man down. The mate knocks you down with a big caps and bar. Oh, give, give me, me some, some time to, to blow the man down. down. Yes, it's larboard and starboard. On deck you will sprawl. Way, hey, blow the man down. For kicking Jack Williams commands this black ball. Oh, give, give me some time to blow the man down. The bar in the first line of this verse was not a place to get a last shot of whiskey before the ship sailed. It was actually a sandbar at the entrance to Liverpool Bay, and once the ship passed that, they were out into the Irish Sea. The bar in the second line was also not a drinking establishment, but it was a heavy stick of wood, uh, several feet long, that was used by the men when heating and working on the capstan. You had to be wicked strong to pick up a capstan bar and hit somebody with it. And the mates on the packet ships, they were the officers, they were both strong and tough. They prided themselves on being known as buckos, which meant they were willing to use their fists and feet to ensure swift obedience to orders. Most packet ships had three mates, with the third mate being just a little bit above in rank uh, an able seaman. The second mate, Oh, was a little bit higher in rank, and the first mate, or chief mate, was the second in command of the whole ship, and the captain relied pretty uh, significantly on their expertise. Mates were known as blowers and strikers by the crew, and woe be unto the green hand who questioned an order or didn't move quick enough. The mate would serve him up a nice helping of Belan pin soup. Now, of course, the mates on packet ships didn't dish out cruel hard usage all on their own. They were following the orders of the captain. The packet ships were almost all American vessels, and most of the captains were handpicked for being both good businessmen and man drivers, so they would stay on schedule. Many of them were New Englanders who went to sea as boys and rose in rank through hard work, determination, and grit. Now, Kickin' Jack Williams was an actual sea captain. His name was John E. Williams, and he was from Mystic, Connecticut. He was famous in the mid-1800s for fast passages both in the North Atlantic and around Cape Horn to San Francisco. When at sea, the captain was a total dictator. His word was absolute law, and he could get away with any kind of hazing and harassment virtually. There are actually very, very few cases where a captain was held accountable for the hard usage and, in some cases, even murder that they inflicted on their crews. Oh, trivia moment. The term starboard, which shows up in this verse, comes from the Vikings. Their longships, which were capable of transatlantic voyages, were steered by a big oar attached to the right side of the ship, and they called this the steerboard and sailors today still call the right side of the ship starboard. To tag onto that, originally the terms starboard and larboard were used to denote right and left, but in 1844 the British Royal Navy changed the word larboard to port to avoid confusion because starboard and larboard sound so similar. It's amazing it took them that long. <laughs> But everyone else followed along, and the term port replaced larboard. It's for topsail halyards, the mate will roar. Away, hey, blow the man down. And lay aloft smartly, a son of a whore. Ho, give me some time to blow the man down. All right, now we'll get into the nitty-gritty of a hauling shanty. 
Uh, first, a disclaimer for all of you old salts who know the difference between a cross trees and a night head. I am gonna do a very high level, simple overview of packet ship rigging, but I am planning a two hour, special two hour shanty talk episode in which all I'll do is talk about the running rigging of a square rigger. So please hold any chastisement you have until then. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm gonna start with a quick primer on the rigging of a packet ship. They had three masts. And from the bow backwards, they were known as the foremast, the main mast, and the mizzen mast. Each of those masts had several yards perpendicular to it. And the yards were what the square sails were attached to. Now, each mast on an 1840s packet ship had at least four yards, which had the same names as the sails that were attached to them. The fore or main yard, they had different names on each mast. Then the topsail yard, the topgallant yard, and the royal yard. The fore and main yards did not move up and down the mast. To set those sails, the sailor simply untied the lashings holding the sail and let it fall down. The other yards moved up and down. And so to set those sails, the sailors had to haul the yard up the mast so the canvas could hang down and catch the wind. In this photo, you can see the sail set on the mizzen mast of a sailing ship. And notice that the top edge of each sail is firmly attached to a yard. There were sails that were not attached to yards. Um, they were called fore and aft sails. And you'll see here in this um, drawing of a packet ship, there are some that are perpendicular to these square sails. But that's a whole nother shanty talk episode, and so I'm not gonna go into four and a half sails today. To haul up a yard, the sailors used a line called a halyard. Get it? Haul yard, halyard. The halyards were attached to the yards with pulleys and ropes known as blocks and tackling, and they led down to the deck where they were tied to a heavy railing known as the pin rail. The pin and pin rail refers to belay and pins. And the lines were tied to these. The way, the way they were designed was the belaying pin went through a hole in the pin rail so that when a line was attached to it, they could quickly pull the pin out of the rail and let go the line to move sails quickly. You may have noticed that the buckle mate in the earlier drawing was holding a belaying pin. They made handy clubs as well as being the main ingredient in belay and pin soup. A little bit of trivia, you may have already figured this out, but the expression learning the ropes comes from sailing ship days. Every sailor was expected to memorize the location and function of each line on the ship and be able to find it in the pitch dark. If you failed to do this, the mate would blow you down with a bland pin or a capstan bar. Take a look at this image of a packet ship. The sails that are second and third up from the deck are the ones that have halyards attached to them. A shanty that was sung while pulling on a halyard was known as, you guessed it, a halyard shanty. There were other kinds of hauling shanties, all of which in, involved pulling on ropes. There were um, sheets and tack shanties and hauling on the braces and cargo handling, but those are future episodes of Shanty Talk. Many of the hauling shanties were used for just one job, and according to the retired sailors that collectors worked with, to collect these old shanties, everyone agreed that below the man down was used mostly for topsail halyards. Now the topsails were the heaviest of the movable sails on the ship. They weighed up to a ton when you figure the weight of the yard in, and it took a lot of hauling to raise them. Therefore, the shanty man would choose a two pole, which was also known as a long haul shanty. The shanty man would sing the first line and the third line, and the crew joined in on the refrains, which were the second and the fourth lines, making two strong pulls on the halyard with each refrain. Here's how that would have looked. So, shanty man starts off. As I was a rolling down Paradise Street, and the crew comes in, Way, hey, blow the man down. A handsome flash packet I chance for to me. Give me some time to blow the man down. 
Now, Hallard Channies usually didn't have the grand chorus that everyone sang along to, like in a capstan or a pump shanty. Now, one reason for this is that it takes a lot of effort to make those two pulls when there's just 10 guys who are raising a 2,000 pound sail and yard. But the shanty was immensely helpful. Sailors at the time um, commonly said that a shanty was worth 10 men on a rope. The main reason was that it allowed the men to coordinate their efforts. They weren't jerking around and struggling on the halyard. Here is a fine drawing of sailors raising the main topsail to a shanty. Uh, look closely and you'll see that everyone is singing and it's entirely possible they're singing blow the man down. In the drawing, the shanty man is the guy in the scally cap standing on the pin rail, higher than everyone else. This way his voice could reach the rest of the gang and he didn't have to pull quite as hard, so he wasn't out of breath. So the takeaway is, <laughs> if you have a good voice and a good memory for lyrics, grab the shanty man spot when the mate orders all hands to the halyards. Oh, it's blow the man up, bullies blow the man down, to me way, way. Blow the man down and blow him right back to Liverpool Town. Oh, give me some time. High enough. That's the mate hollering high enough, which means the yard is all the way up to the mast. Now, high enough was an order from an officer, and so the singing and the hauling stopped instantly. No fancy retardandos or final flourishes for the shanty man. The job was over, and they put the tool, which was the shanty, down until they need it again. But the crew couldn't sit down and take a break. Oh, no, 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 no. Mastheading the yard was only the first part of setting a sail. Next came sweating up, which was a few final short strong pulls to get the yard as high as possible. Braces, which were the lines that swung the yard around the mast so that they could catch the wind and sheets and tacks, which was pulling on the bottom corners of the sails to get them as tight as possible so they could get the maximum speed out of the breeze. Each of these jobs had its own shanties, so there was a lot of singing going on when the captain ordered that all sails be set. Well, that's the story of Blow the Man Down. Thanks so much for tuning in. I wanna give a big, Shout out to my shanty crew for this uh, voyage. It was composed of Fran Goodwin, Armand Armin, and Benedict Gagliardi, and they did a great job. I had, didn't have to touch a belay and pin once. If you wanna continue learning about shanties, please do subscribe to, to the channel, and feel free to compose a comment if you have a question or you'd like to give me the gift of feedback. Now, if you've already mowed the lawn, and taking out the trash and you still got to kill some time, you can come over to my website, jerrybryantsings.com. If you want to listen to the whole song without all the chatter in between the verses, there's a great slightly body version of Blow the Man Down from the classic Smithsonian Folkways recording called Steady As She Goes. Here's the link. Well, until we meet again, I wish you farewell. <laughs>